with well, that's true. That, that, that was uh, that was a historic moment also for me as well because actually we had started in 2008 and then we had the experience in 2013. So we had two designing for life events. One more, uh, the one, the first one, the early one was more devoted to Medellin, and the latest one was more devoted to Caracas. Basically, basically that th those were some differences. Yes. And it all started with a newspaper article in 2007 on the refrigerator door. I'm glad I right. was reading the newspaper that day. So, right. Um, so, uh, is everyone okay asking your questions in the chat? Uh, we want two questions right away. And I think the chat closes at 10 30. Uh, but basically, mm -hmm. we want uh, at least three questions. Um, or it's due at 1030. I guess you can keep submitting them, but we want at least the first two of your minimum of three questions between now and 1030. Question number one, hey, we're going to be challenged by all these problems in the 21st century. Uh, we need to know the answer to this question. And hopefully that question will drive us back in history in search of some, some answers for you. And secondly, Hey, uh, thanks for the reading, but uh, wow, there's a big hole in my understanding. Based on the reading, I need to know uh, the answer to this question. Um, so is everyone able to access the chat on Brightspace? Mm -hmm. If not, I, I believe um, your classmates, uh, Klaumar and Carrington especially, are standing by to help you out because they have been so helpful in the course so far. So without um, further delay, um, I'm going to share my screen and present some slides. Um, and here we go. So um, designing for life is a topic that is near and dear to our hearts. Um, as we've said, um, this is something um, that began uh, over 13 years ago. And uh, it's been a big part of the work that Manuel and I have done separately and together over those years. And Wentworth has played a very important role generally in uh, advancing the concepts around designing for life. Um, and it, uh, it starts with uh, looking at the world and uh, paying attention to things uh, that should concern us and actually kind of upset us, especially if we're architects and we're trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Uh, and here's a situation that is typical of the kinds of things we like to analyze. And this is one of one student's analysis uh, of this situation. This is not a photo collage. This is an actual place um, in um, Sao Paulo. And um, it, it's, it's a startling situation. And it drives us to ask the question, how did this happen? Why is this architecture the way it is? And I want to tell a, uh, a story about when I was a, a sophomore or junior in, in architecture school, the way architecture was taught at the time, um, it was my second or third year of architecture school, but it was my fifth or sixth year of college, uh, generally, because I had studied a lot of things previous to architecture. And I remember one day I walked through the stacks of the library and I was walking, I was probably walking through um, the part of the library where there was economics or history or geog geography or languages or anthropology or sociology, but I was overwhelmed with this feeling, ah, oh, I don't need to know any of this stuff. Uh, all I need to do is go down the aisle, the NA, if you're looking at the Dewey Decimal System or the uh, Library of Congress system, the NA zero to 9,000, that's where the beautiful picture books of architecture are. And I was so relieved 
to think that all I had to do was know about how beautiful architecture is produced uh, and that's it. Well, ever since then, it's almost like uh, the world has exacted its revenge on me. Because <clears throat> every time I look at a situation and I say, what's up with that? It drives us into questions of political science, of game theory, of economics, of sociology, of anthropology, of geography, of engineering systems. And it turns out that as architects, if we want to do our job well, we kind of have to uh, know a lot about a lot of different things just to ask, just to answer this question intelligently. What's up with that? <laughs> so uh, the designing for life uh, question is around um, this, this type of questioning. What's up with that? Why uh, are some cities so damn dangerous. So I looked up this morning, the latest st statistics. Uh, the most dangerous cities in the world are in Mexico, Venezuela, South Africa, Brazil, and yes, embarrassingly and uh, astonishingly, uh, the wealthiest country in the world, the United States of America, the highest murder rates in the world. The most dangerous place to go right now uh, in the world is Tijuana, Mexico. It's basically an extension of Southern California, just over the border below uh, the California uh, state line. So that's a lot of murders, 134 per 100,000. Uh, what, uh, what is the most dangerous city in history? Um, and you might think that it's uh, a place where a war has been fought. But you would be wrong. There has never been a city at war, uh, not in ancient Rome. Um, well, maybe uh, they leave uh, the atomic bomb drops on Hiroshima and Nagasaki out of this. But it turns out that the most dangerous uh, city in the world in <clears throat> history was Medellin, Colombia in 1993 when it hit. Uh, <clears throat> an all-time world record of 391 murders per 100,000 population. Uh, and if you've seen um, the movie or the, the series Narcos, um, maybe you understand some of that history. Um, but let's look a little bit at it. As most of you know, Medellin was the base of operations for Pablo Escobar's drug cartel during the 1980s. Now, within Medellin, one area stood out as not only being the most densely populated area in the city, but also one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the world, Comuna 13. Along with cartel violence, left-wing guerrilla groups were active in the area, and the conflict eventually came to a boiling point known as Operation Orion. On October 16th, 2002, government Apache helicopters flew over the neighborhood and began to fire at anything that moved. The government stated that only a dozen people were killed, but the actual number is said to be in the hundreds. The attack became known for the widespread human rights violations, and 15 years later, many of the people there still don't have answers. From then on, the state left the Comuna in total neglect and never recognized the abuses that the inhabitants experienced. So um, this is just to give a little bit of the history of um, how Medellin got to be in this horrible, horrible situation. And I believe uh, we've, we've studied this video um, in previous classes, correct? Um, it, it talks about, starts to use game theory to help us understand how things could get so bad. It's not because there are a bunch of, it's not just because there are bad people like Pablo Escobar, but it's partly because there are incentives to, uh, to rob, cheat, and steal. And uh, in a way, some people would say, uh, and people who use the tragedy of the commons as an example, they point out that uh, the game, the rules of the game are set up such that uh, if you don't uh, take advantage uh, of other people when you have the opportunity, then you're just a loser. 
And uh, the only rational path is to maximize your own personal gain and therefore um, uh, uh, get ahead and be a winner. And that's how we determine winners and losers. So I'm going to ask questions along the way and I kind of need to see people's faces nodding yes, no, up and down. Um, so please everyone either turn on your camera or send a message to um, one of us. Why don't you send a message to me in private uh, telling me where you're at, giving me an update at where you're at with your efforts to get your camera working. Um, and uh, I've already intervened uh, in a couple cases, getting DTS to, uh, to step up and supply a camera, uh, a working camera, such, so that if you, you have a Wentworth-issued uh, laptop, you're welcome. And um, that laptop needs to have a working camera. If it doesn't, uh, you uh, have a right to uh, ask DTS to give you um, either fix the camera in your laptop or give you a supplementary ca uh, camera. I'm still not seeing a lot of thank you uh, for those of you who've turned on your cameras. Um, please, the rest of you, um, we're, we're waiting for your cameras. Thank you. Just on a practical level, I need at least one screen full of faces looking at me so I can get feedback. So um, yes or no, you understand, we looked at this tragedy of the commons video and you get it, right? It's something you get. Yes? <clears throat> no? Yes? Thank you, Joshua. Yes? No? Okay. Thank you, David. Um, so we're going to go a little deeper beyond the prisoners. I mean, beyond. We're going to go beyond um, the tragedy of the commons to look at the prisoner's dilemma. Have you guys, do you guys know about the prisoner's dilemma? Yeah? No? Okay. There's enough no's out there. Thank you, everyone, for your cameras and your, your uh, feedback. So we're going we're gonna to do a similar thing. The, the same guy, uh, Jasper Oscar, I think his name is, um, gave us a video on the prisoner's dilemma. The prisoner's dilemma is uh, an interesting game theory model that demonstrates how Sometime, in some corners of capitalism, this is how the rules of the game work, that um, in order to maximize my own uh, self-interest, I sometimes do things that end up victimizing everyone, including myself. Even, I, did, I don't want that to be the outcome. I just want to play by the rules and get ahead. But by playing by the rules, without a real understanding of how the game works, I am actually victimizing people around me. I don't, I'm not a mean person. And ultimately it's harming myself. And I'm presenting this to try to get at the question that I have after reading this reading. I mean, it's a pretty good reading, but my God, it's got some holes. What about Medellin, Colombia and Caracas, Venezuela and this idea of designing for life that Manuel Delgado is working on uh, his entire career, what is the connection between game theory and designing for life? So that's what this is attempt. So let's see if we can figure it out together. And I would appreciate, remember, <clears throat> you guys are collaborators in this struggle. We are working together to, to try to figure out how to solve these problems. 
thank you for your in advance for your help with this. So here we go. Let's say Mr. Blue and Miss Red have you been can arrested for some minor crime. Yeah. The police think they committed a more serious crime, but they don't have enough evidence to convict them. They need a confession. They take them and put them in separate rooms so they can't talk and play a little game. To try to force a confession, the police give them each a choice. Admit your partner committed the crime and you will go free. We'll pardon you for the minor crime, but your partner will have to spend three years in prison. If you stay silent and your partner lets us know that you were the one who really did it, then you're going to have to go away for three years. They know that the police don't have any evidence, and if they both stay silent, then they will only go to prison one year each for the minor crime. If they both betray each other, then they'll both go to prison for two years each. Okay, each partner can do one of two things. Oops. What was that? Sorry about that. No service. Okay, you had to start again. I had a <clears throat> technical difficulty there. Sorry about that. Mm. So it's a little confusing. Maybe it's not such a bad thing to go over this again. I can't advance it. Uh, it's a limitation of the technology. Sorry about that. Let's say Mr. Blue and Miss Red have each been arrested for some minor crime. The police think they committed a more serious crime, but they don't have enough evidence to convict them. They need a confession. They take them and put them in separate rooms so they can't talk and play a little game. To try to force a confession, the police give them each a choice. Admit your partner committed the crime and you will go free. We'll pardon you for the minor crime, but your partner will have to spend three years in prison. If you stay silent and your partner lets us know that you were the one who really did it, then you're going to have to go away for three years. They know that the police don't have any evidence, and if they both stay silent, then they will only go to prison one year each for the minor crime. If they both betray each other, then they'll both go to prison for two years each. Okay, each partner can do one of two things, stay silent or betray. Staying silent would be cooperating and betraying would be defecting. If they both stay silent, then they each spend a year in prison. If one betrays and the other stays silent, then the betrayer goes free and the silent spends three years in prison. If they both betray, then it's two years each. So what are they going to do? Well, they should cooperate. That's the best option for the group if we add the total number of years in prison. But let's take it from Red's perspective. If she thinks Blue is going to stay silent, then she should betray so she can go free. Going free is better than spending a year in prison. If she thinks he's going to betray her, then she should definitely betray. Two years in jail is better than three and being made a fool of. Blue is in the exact same situation and will think the exact same thing. He should betray if she stays silent and he should betray if she betrays. They should have both cooperated, but from an individual standpoint, they notice they could always gain by defecting if they have no control over what the other person's going to do. So they'll both defect to try to better their own situation, but come away not only hurting the group, but themselves. Individually, they're worse off than if they both cooperate operated. This situation is pretty made up, but it has some real world analogs. A common example is with marketing. Let's say two cigarette companies, Red Strikes and Smooth Blue, are deciding how much money they should spend on advertising. Since the product they each make is identical to one another, advertising has a huge impact on sales. For simplicity, let's say their choices are to advertise a bunch or not advertise at all. And there's just 100 people in this society and they all smoke. If both don't advertise, then just by random chance picking cigarette boxes, 50 people buy Red Strikes and 50 people buy Smooth Blue. At $2 a pack, they each make $100. Let's say advertising costs costs $30. If one person advertises and the other does not, then 80 people will buy the cigarettes from the ads and 20 people buy the other ones. The advertiser makes $160 minus $30 for ads and comes away with $130. The non-advertiser didn't spend any money but only made $40. If they both advertise, again half will buy Red Strikes and half will buy Smooth Blue. But since they both spent $30 on advertising, they only come away with $70 each. Same deal, both people cooperating and not advertising is the most preferable situation, but both companies can see that advertising will always make them more money. But unlike the prisoners in jail, these companies can talk and try to influence each other. From here, Blue would be better off if Red didn't advertise. Red wouldn't go for that because that would be worse for them. Blue could try to convince Red that they would both not advertise, the only other situation where they're both better off. But without any real obligation to each other, there's nothing that's stopping them from trying to advertise to gain more of the market anyway. If you think your opponent's going to not advertise, then you're better off advertising. 
Although we're still making assumptions to make this situation work too. With this model, we're assuming they only play once. The game changes when the players have a chance to build a relationship and work together to get more gains over time, or punish each other by not cooperating. Also, to make the model work, we have to make up rules for the player. So, um, here's an example with the word split written inside. Of where Let's this was made into a game show. Word steel written inside. I will ask you in a moment to choose either the split or the steel. If you both choose the split ball, you will split today's jackpot of forty thousand and fifteen pounds, and you will go home, each of you, with twenty thousand seven pounds fifty. <laughs> if one of you chooses split and the other one chooses steel, whoever chooses the split ball goes home with nothing. But whoever chooses the steel ball goes home with the whole forty thousand and fifteen pounds. Here's the rub: if you both choose the steel ball, you both go home with nothing. So this is the prisoner's dilemma made into a game show in England. And uh, basically, it's seen as being entertaining to see two people try to negotiate, hey, let's, let's uh, both choose split so we both get half. But uh, the incentive, if, you know, well, you'll see, you'll see how it works. Here they, here they are about to try to, they're now going to try to convince each other to both split the 40,000 pounds. We have come such a long way together. I've brought you through, you've brought through me through, so we're both equals. 20,000, which is half, is more than I thought I would go away with today. So I am more than happy to split with you if I can trust you to do the same with me. Yeah. I, I guarantee you, I could shake on it now, I guarantee you at the beginning of the game, yeah. if you took me through that round, I would split, and I still intend to split with you. What I'm going to say to you is, I had my cards read, and I was told if I play fair, I will come away with a substantial amount of money. I'm going to look into your eyes when we're asked to make the decision. And I'm going to be truthfully honest with you. If I look into your eyes and I see that you're genuine and you're going to split that money with me, I promise you, I will make the same decision with you. Can't be more straightforward and honest than that. Okay. Pretty convincing, right? Well, here's what happens. I'm involved until next time. Goodbye. Oh, we missed it. When Tracy revealed the split ball, I can't really explain how I thought I was just so over the moon. Having lost over £20,000, I'm just I'm speechless. I don't even know how to put it into words. It's a life-changing amount of money that I just had in my hands and lost within seconds of getting it. At the end of the day, if you can bluff your way to £40,000, you deserve that. So he's basically, so he lied. Um, she said split, he said steal, and he wins. Um, so it's a classic playing out of the prisoner's dilemma made into a game show, and they think it's very entertaining. Um, now, the whole reason I'm giving you this background is I want to demonstrate a case in which someone who understands the game theory approach to this then flips the whole system on its head. And uh, this is something that I want us to compare with what happened in maybe in Colombia. Well, um, let's see, before we do that. And so, I'm uh, sorry, I got the sequence wrong. So now we're gonna look at, um, if this plays, we're gonna look at the outcome of this type of prisoner's dilemma in the economic system. Have you guys seen this uh, wealth inequality video in the United States? Joseph seen it. Is Richard, has anybody else seen this video before? Um, Shay has seen it. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show it. Um, so this is what happens when you set up a system that is run like the prisoner's dilemma. This is what's at stake and this is the outcome. There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. 
a Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups, they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution. And 92%, that's at least nine out of 10 of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think exists in this country. So ignore the ideal for a moment. Here's what we think it is again. And here is the actual distribution shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart, but the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than nine out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind blowing. But let's look at it another way because I find this chart kind of difficult to wrap my head around. Instead, let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are. Teachers, coaches, firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Now let's line them up according to their wealth. Poorest people on the left, wealthiest on the right, just a steady row of folks based on their net worth. We'll color code them like we did before based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism, all the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream, keep our country moving forward. So here's that ideal we asked everyone about, something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. Nine out of 10 people, 92%, said this was a nice ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. This is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30% are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly 100 times that of the poorest Americans, and about 10 times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change. And the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10% are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top two to 5% are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1%, this guy, well, his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. This is the top 1% we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own because he won't fit on my chart. 1% of America has 40% of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80%, Eight out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, only has 7% between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years. While the richest 
take home almost a quarter of the national income today. In 1976, they took home only 9%, meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. The top 1% own half the... So add this to the list of things to be upset yeah, about you with to, your parents. Um, trust me, 100%, I'm going to pick the steel ball. So this so is... Now we're back to the example where this guy is a stockbroker. He understands game theory. Um, I want you to um, trust me. 100%, I'm going to pick the steel ball. Sorry, you're going to, I'm going to choose the steel ball. You're going to take the I want you to do split, and I promise you that I will split the money with you. But after you took the steel. Yeah. You're going to take steel. Yeah. I'm going to take split. Yeah. So you take the money. And I will split it with you. After the show. Yeah. <laughs> I promise you I'll do that. If, if if you do steal, we both walk away with nothing. I'm telling you 100% no, I'm going to do it. I appreciate that. Right, I'll give you another alternative. Why don't we just both pick split? I'm not going to pick split. I'm going to steal. Abraham, honestly, 100% I'm going to steal. It's in your nature to steal. No, I, I'm honest, and I'm going to tell you're you... You're honest. I am. That's why I'm telling you I'm going to steal. If you do split, then I will I split the money. I can't see nothing. Okay, well, I'm going to steal, so we're going to leave with nothing. Where's your brains coming from? <laughs> I can't work out. I know that I'm a decent guy and I will split the money with you. Well, we should just both split then. No, I'm going to do steal. There is no legal no, I know, I there is. I'm not for him to give you the of money. Of course. If I gave you my word, now let me, let me tell you what my word means. Okay. My father once said to me, a man who doesn't keep his word is not a man. It's not worth nothing. It's not worth a not worth a dollar. I agree. So Ibrahim, I'm gonna steal. So you've got the choice. <laughs> you either steal and we both walk away with nothing. Because you know I've told you my intention and I've told you that I will split the money with you, Ibrahim. If I gave my word that I was gonna split, I would split. And you're gonna take steal. So is Ibrahim intending to take split? No. He's watched the show. He knows the prisoner's dilemma. He knows the rules of the game. And the rules of the game are what we saw in the previous iteration, where you come in, you convince the other person that you're going to do split, and then you trick them into choosing split, and then you choose steal. That's the only path forward until this stockbroker who understands game theory, he comes in. And he says, listen, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to steal. And so uh, he's gaming the system itself. Here's what happens. Maybe some of you can guess what he's about to do. But here's what he actually does. It's a tough one. We've lost it. We've lost everything. Okay. Faster. They're walking away with no money because you're an idiot. No, that's you're not. An idiot. You're an idiot. That's what's right. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. Split, split or steal? Yes, congratulations, you're both split and each received <laughs> 6,800 pounds. So, um, so by knowing the system, he games the system, he lies, he's, and, and uh, you know, so that, that's the example I want you to take with you to understand the thinking that goes into uh, turning around the worst urban crisis in human history in Medellin, Colombia until the next worst human crisis in human history, Caracas, Venezuela. And so this is the game theory context for understanding how the architecture of the city works. Now we have to go back for a moment to the city of Barcelona and the architect urbanist, Joan Busquets. Joan Busquets uh, was called upon uh, to 
uh, manage the process by which Barcelona can be transformed in order to host the 1992 Olympic Games. And uh, so there was a lot of architecture involved. This one here in particular, this is Frank Gehry's uh, fish. This was the moment of the birth of AutoCAD, computer autom computed, computer assisted design tools were born with this fish, fish uh, shape uh, at the, for the 1992 Olympics. Barcelona was transformed. The Olympics was used as a, an investment vehicle for transforming the city of Barcelona. And it was kind of remarkable in that it started with a group of architects looking at urban form, not from a planning perspective, but from an architectural space perspective. Now, um, in the first lecture of this course, we looked at uh, the work of Weldon Priest with Wentworth students and how uh, examples of how uh, fragments of the city and urban form can be drawn in an architectural manner. This is the second best version of that that John Busquets and his team of architects drew the city of Barcelona in an architectural manner, getting a perspective on the quality of space that made it possible to then go on to develop and manipulate the space and uh, design the space uh, through the architectural transformation of the city that had remarkable uh, positive impacts for everyone. So it, it, it stands as an important reference point for everything uh, that we do in the 21st century. Um, this moment in Barcelona, Spain in uh, 1992 is a very important reference point that has transformed the way urban design has, is being taught at Harvard. Joan Busquets um, teaches at Harvard or has taught at Harvard. And it has gone on to influence the way we do uh, the urbanism concentration. And it lies at the roots, more importantly, of how uh, the cities of Latin America have developed and been transformed through architectural interventions at the urban scale uh, in the decades since the Barcelona Olympics. So uh, the first example we want to look at in uh, Latin America is the work of architect Jaime Lerner in the city of Curitiba, Brazil. Who's from Brazil? Is anyone from Brazil? Do we have anyone from Brazil here? We usually have someone. Or whose family is from Brazil? Okay. Not seeing anyone. Okay. So, um, Jaime Lerner was an architect and planner, and he entered a competition for the transformation of Curitiba, Brazil, and he lost. But he disagreed with the jury so vehemently, and he was so upset by the failure to take the steps that he and his team envisioned that he did what architects sometimes have to do, he ran for mayor. And for over two decades, he was either the mayor of Curitiba or the governor of the province. Um, I think it's power, I can't remember the name of the province, um, Curitiba. So here's another video, oh my God, so many videos. <laughs> By the 1970s, the population of Curitiba had grown nearly tenfold in 50 years and was clogged with cars. Lerner knew the solution was in public transport, but how to make it work in a cash poor city. They could tell uh, what is the secret of Curitiba. One is, is a kind of commitment with simplicity. We didn't have fear of simplicity. 
Because the city is not so complex that the complexity sellers want us to understand. So Lerner created main arterial traffic paths, each with three roads, one leading into the city, one out, and a central road with two-way traffic and dedicated bus-only lanes to speed passengers in and out of the center. He invented the bus rapid transit system with 25,000 passengers a day. Now we're transporting more than 2 million passengers. And it's one of the few systems in the world which is not subsidized. It pays by itself. Lona introduced triple articulated buses to carry more passengers. We can transport in this simple system more passengers than on the subway. The cost 100 times or 200 times less expensive than a subway. And we can do it, we can implement the system in less than two years. So Jaime Lerner invented bus rapid transit uh, in the 70s. And since then, mm -hmm. every city in the world has either embraced the bus rapid transit in their next expansion or is now looking at it. If you know about this thing called the Silver Line in the city of Boston, the city of Boston uh, has implemented a bus rapid transit system invented by an architect in the 70s that uh, because his ideas were not being implemented, did what some of you might need to do, which is run for public office. So from Curitiba, mm -hmm. it moved on to uh, Bogota, Colombia, and other cities of uh, Latin America. And it arrived in Medellin, Colombia. And here you see the orange line is the murder rate of the city of Medellin, Colombia in comparison with other cities in Colombia. And you see the peak in 1991. And then you see this abrupt drop. And this is primarily because the drug wars of the cities of Colombia were finally being won by the military of Colombia. They were driving out the drug cartels, um, not completely, but they, the drug cartels uh, were forced to move their activities out into the countryside. And enter um, someone who has become, he, is, he was a friend of Manuel Delgado's long before this, uh, and has since become a friend of Wentworth Architecture. Uh, he is uh, a young, handsome, uh, like always wearing blue jeans. He ran for mayor of uh, Colombia, uh, of Medellin, Colombia, and he won in a landslide. And here he is campaigning by walk, doing the unthinkable, walking through the neighborhoods of Colombia mm. with only one or two people with him, not an armed uh, squadron of soldiers to protect him. He won a landslide and he pulled, uh, he understood the game theory of Made in Colombia. The game theory of Made in Colombia is if you are wealthy and powerful, run for office, uh, get elected, and then uh, steal hundreds of thousands, hundreds of, hundreds of millions of dollars mm -hmm. each year of revenue. Um, and through corruption and put it in your pocket, take care of the wealthiest neighborhoods and ignore the informal settlements. And that's what they did for decades in Colombia, uh, in Medellin, Colombia. And that's what resulted in the 391 uh, murder capital of the world in uh, 1991. Um, and a group of people uh, got together, many of them mm. architects. Mm. Fajardo's father uh, is one of the more successful architects of Medellin um, while he was growing up. He's a mathematician who got a PhD in mathematics at the University of Wisconsin in the United States. And um, what he and his team did when they got elected 
is they, in, instead of uh, taking this cable car system and putting it in the wealthiest neighborhood, they looked at where the, the most bodies were piling up, where was the highest murder rate in the city of Medellin. And uh, they, instead of putting the cable car where the wealthiest people lived, they put the cable car where it could do the most good. They had architectural competitions and they gave world-class architecture to the most miserable uh, neighborhoods of Medellin. This is where Pablo Escobar and his gangs piled up the bodies the most. So this was the location where they put the first uh, of what are now about 20 library parks. It's called a library park, but it is much more than a library and much more than a park. And it was integrated with the larger city through uh, a cable car system so that instead of taking a uh, half hour or an hour for people who live high up on these hillsides to come down and, and connect with the city, it was cut to 15 minutes. Those plastic bottles that a tree's growing is the idea that once you know someone dies, instead of taking revenge, you plant a tree. These are all people who have been killed through the fighting. Three different groups were fighting for control of the place. And basically it's just mercenaries and like teenagers killing each other. The idea is not to dwell on the past and enact revenge, but to plant a tree in order to hope for the future. And they focused on education and infrastructure. I'm, I moved to, uh, I took a sabbatical from Wentworth and I moved to Medellin with my family uh, in 2014. And I took lots of drone shots, but um, I was very bad as a drone pilot. And so this is a much better uh, video than I could have taken at the time of an escalator that they put in. They asked the people, what do you need? And they said, we need a way to get up and down the hill. And, uh, uh, and uh, so that, that's what they did. So the, it looks like a lot of top-down projects, but the key understanding that I gained that I was looking for when I moved my family here was to understand why this wasn't just the government imposing these projects on people. This is a trip that Manuel brought me on. First, we went to Caracas in 2009, I think it was, Manuel? Eight, eight or nine, nine. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And these are all of our friends, uh, Rafael and others. Uh, and we went, uh, first we toured Caracas and then we toured Medellin. And um, this is what we found. And this is Sergio Fajardo speaking about the work. In the year 2004, we got into power. We were a, a group of people coming from different sectors of society who have created a civic independent movement. And we have perfectly clear what we wanted to do once in power, to fight the social inequalities and the violence that we have had in our city. And we needed the formula, the recipe, in order to face those challenges. Decrease violence, and whenever we decrease violence, then we immediately we came up with the social opportunities. Those social opportunities were centered about education how education understood in a broad sense, which meant education, science, technology, development of productive activities, culture, all those things together should be the way we should go in order to become a better, much better society. And he did it by demonstrating, you know, what separated him from previous politicians who show up with lots of promises is he demonstrated how serious he was by in four short years, less than four years, he designed and built five library parks. He built the cable car system um, that uh, you read about in the reading. Han venido niños de cinco años, de seis, de siete, que no sabían manejar computadores y aquí han aprendido a manejarlos, a manejar el mouse. Para ellos ha sido todo un reto y un sueño tener contacto con esos computadores. Entonces es una labor muy, muy bella que hacen las bibliotecas, que hacen las bibliotecas de tener esa oportunidad de, de una inclusión social en que aquí no hay diferencia. So it's not about, uh, it's, and I, this is a really important point. The architects did not save the people of Medellin, Colombia. 
It was the social programs. It were the educational initiatives, the job opportunities, the job training. Um, it were the social programs that were the primary transformative move. But unless there, those, those social programs had been packaged in the vehicle of uh, architecture, uh, prominent architecture, well-designed architecture, the architecture of human dignity. Without that architecture of human dignity, those social programs would not have been successful. And that is the Designing for Life thesis. Architecture did not save the city of Medellin. Architecture will not save the city of Caracas. Architecture does not save cities on their own. But without the vehicle of architecture, it's a lot harder to do. Some would say it's not possible to do it without the transformative uh, role of architecture in all of this. Medellín, todos saben, viene de épocas duras, de épocas de violencia y está transitando un camino de superación en el cual la inclusión de los más pobres es una de las estrategias fundamentales. Sabemos que el desarrollo es verdaderamente importante si incluye a los más humildes y sabemos que en el tiempo actual los más humildes podrán estar realmente incluidos si cerramos la brecha digital. So uh, this is an example of how uh, they flipped the game. If, if we look back at the game theory approach that uh, I presented at the start, uh, instead of uh, the, the wealthy and the powerful doing everything they can to support their friends and their, uh, their class, they do the opposite of that. They identify the people who have the greatest needs and those are the people they give the greatest quality architecture, urban form, uh, mobility, uh, public transportation in Curitiba, in Bogota, in Medellin, and next in Caracas. This is the strategy for uh, flipping the game uh, as we saw in the golden ball um, uh, suggestion. Very soon after uh, Sergio Fajardo stepped down from being mayor of Medellin, one of his first trips outside of Colombia, uh, he was distracted by the fact that he was running for president of Colombia. One of the first places he came is Wentworth Institute of Technology because he's a friend of Manuel Delgado's and now a friend of the, the department of the program. And here he is in Watson Hall giving an address called From Fear to Hope. How do these programs um, weaponized with architect, with high quality architecture, how they were so impactful in only four years to really turn around the whole situation in the city of Medellin. And um, so I, I, I think I'm just going to um, leave it there and pass it over to you, Manuel. Great, Robert, thank you very much uh, for this uh, wonderful, summary of the situation here. I'm trying to share the screen and... I will stop sharing so you can see your screen. Does that help? Okay. I have desktop one. Let's see. You could close that one. This one I can close? Okay. Yeah. I'm looking at the slideshow, one second. So share screen, first or first I have to look at the slideshow, one second. Okay.
Are you looking at the screen now? No. Um, yeah. We need to click on. Okay. Screen. One second. How about now? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> now just click on present in the upper right. Okay. In the start presentation again here. <clears throat> and you might need to scroll forward to um yes i didn't i need to move start of yours <clears throat> sorry about the ads on the youtube that's so obnoxious i'll have to figure out how to solve that if anyone has some tech support ideas on how to get rid of the ads without signing up um for anything please let me know thank you So while Manuel is getting this, yes, you were mentioning, uh, you know, um, the key yeah. thing that Manuel is going to show us uh, is uh, first. Um, well, you go ahead. You're there. Mm. All set. Yes, it's here. It's here. Okay. Medellin and Caracas, I would say they are they are like sister cities. It's very curious, and you have to see the situation, or you you have to perceive. Sometimes the two cities are so similar that they are difficult, they're difficult to recognize. They are both valleys. They are both around three, two, two three, uh, or four million, two, three million approximately people. They both have a river that, that goes through the center of the city that is kind of a sewer. It, it was a river originally, but that, uh, that transformed into a sewer because of the disposals of the city. They went directly there in both cases. The only thing that really is different is the orientation. The Caracas Valley, like you see here, is a valley pointing to east-west. So it's like a like an east-west um, um, displacement in the in the land. And Medellin is north-south. So the the situation of the, the that is a big change because the sun raises in Caracas in a one position that is completely different than the one in Medellin, but the, the the sad thing about that is that they have lived <clears throat> the nice story, but they have also lived the sad stories. And the the Caracas uh, situation came uh, that that um, that uh, Robert is referring comes after the Medellin um, big big huge problem of uh, drug cartels and and danger and and murder happens. Then Medellin starts to re, re, to, to to resonate to start starts to come back from there, and Caracas start, starts to go into the same problem. The, there is a very deep problem of governance and and in the in the in the country of Venezuela that I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to talk about what would that happen if this uh, if the city would be transformed. With the mentality that we learn in Medellin and we learn in, in Curitiba and other cities that we have studied, but at the same time taking into consideration the natural the conditions of each of the place. <clears throat> so, the the in 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 nineteen in twenty in twenty twelve there was a competition for well, the, within a plan for Caracas. There, there was a plan going on Caracas twenty twenty at that moment. <clears throat> Was in that plan. There was uh, a competition to highlight the, the to maximize the impact of a land that was left in the city of Caracas as a an airport that was kind of a, an internal business airport that uh, that uh, some people had, like to to go to their haciendas or to go to their factory somewhere in the interior of the city. Of the of the country, or even to go to the beach and the, enjoy the islands in the Caribbean, etc. So the 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 La Carlota Airport stayed there since 1960s, and the the the, the 2020 Caracas plan added the point that we the 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 the, 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 the city had to modify the ten in order to solve many problems that the city had that are not are not uh, attacked properly. So one of those problems was the importance and the scale of this element, this this uh, airport, private airport, that divided the city completely. It was kind of uh, in the middle of connections, so stopped the traffic 
complicated the relation, the connections between north and south, separated the, the isolated the original park that already existed there in the, in the position, which is the the park that listed. You see it here in the um, towards the left, <clears throat> and then and basically you can see the the situation of the of the artificial construction of a of a flat land that was not and accompanied by the canal of the river that supposed to drain fast when rains in order to get all the all the water and also the dirt of the city out of the city so they they planned the 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 the, the institutions the previous institutions uh, planned the river in a way that would be a solution to get rid of the water very easily and the other problem that the city has that overwhelms the city is a tra traffic problem through the use of individual cars that you see there. The, the, the tremendous influence of the highways, elevated highways that were done not in, supposedly to communicate the city horizontally and, and keep it working in the, in the, in the, up on the surface. All that was not working at all and <clears throat> investment had been very high in 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 those previous years in order to try to solve those problems so we participated in that competition that was open uh, in, uh, and and we had the, the privilege to know a group of uh, architects from medellin young architects from medellin who had so the the the, the leader of the of them uh, the which was the oldest is uh, jorge perez jaramillo Jorge was the, the dean of the School of Architecture of the, of the Catholic University in Medellin, and he had three students who had been called Opus, Oficina de Proyectos Urbanos, Opus. So Jorge introduced me to the group, Opus group, and I invited them to participate. And I invited them to Caracas to see the case and see if we should participate, actually, if we, if we would have ideas to participate. And, at the beginning, we didn't know, we didn't have any idea or what was uh, all about. So we found we ended. We found this this situation. This is a this is like a two kilo, kilometer long site uh, because this is almost one, one. It's like one 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 mile twenty two hundred something like this, one and a quarter mile. And uh, the, 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 the highway goes on the north part, dividing the more dense, the more dense areas of the city are in the top part. These are the axis of the city in the top. And we found, this, and the first reaction, I have to tell you when we got into the competition and we decided, the first reaction is why, what do we have to do to make this work? And probably the response was, let's see, let's analyze the possibility of doing nothing. Doing nothing means what would happen if you just, just turn out the, uh, to, the to throw out the, the, the fence. There is a fence that, should, that protects this because this is a, a, an aerial base now. It's an it's a aerial base that, uh, that uh, is supposed to be, is closed, supposed to be protected. And so we propose, what about Taking all everything out, taking things out would represent well. If we take the, if we break the, the 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 runway and take it out as well, what would it happen if we start the people from the north start connecting with the south, walking and creating their own path, and and without any preliminary investment, we can have some public place that is open to the public and and uh, as you see the density of the city around with with the we bring the people together in some way. Well, that was the first thought. And we uh, continued in the development and the process. We went to the first phase of three, uh, three, um, three, three selected winners. We were selected in the first three uh, finalists. And then there was a cycle of lectures and events and discussions with the other comp competitors that were approximately, I would say not 97, I think it was the number. Or not, no, 97. I think it was 96 or 95. The thing is that we had uh, we had a the catalog of many possibilities exposed in, in the University of Venezuela that we went there to see, and we spent like a week analyzing all the other proposals which 
very interesting solutions and points. And, and we also had the opportunity to see the final two other final, finalists that were competing with us for the second phase, which would be the, the select the, the winner. In that, <clears throat> in that event, we discovered that the only group that had demolished completely the runway was our group, uh, because there was an option to keep it temporary, to keep the temporary one, to keep it a uh, partial one. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about the issues of the runway in the next few slides behind. So, but we came to, to a conclusion that we needed to propose that the, the La Carlota Park should come transform itself into a place of integration of many forces that dest have destroyed the city and we have to make it the opposite. This has to be the reintegration of natural and social forces in Caracas to transform the city, not only the park, the city with the park as a, as a motivator, as a, as a dynamic. Like, so we found, we, we researched, we, I, uh, and I promise, I can tell you that I never studied La Carlota before that opportunity. So I, that was my first time as, the, uh, as well as the, the first time of the other two competitors that we met together to think together this fresh, and I had my experience, of course, in the city because I was born there. And as we, I, I will talk more about the city uh, in which I was born later in another lecture in the semester. I, I don't want I want to share with you some of my early experiences. But this was actually a mature experience, very in 2012. But I I, I, I confess that for me, La Carlota, even though I lived there, I lived very close to the edges of La Carlota. I never studied as an architect, as, uh, as, as, actually, not even here in the competition, this project can be considered a project. That, that's something that I want to, to, to share with you and, and tell you why. So we, instead of calling this project, we talked about uh, strategies, which we thought would be more uh, accurate because this is, about, besides that this is like a war, so we need a strategy and tactics and things to win the war because this is a war uh, uh, in favor of the city, in favor of the space. If, if besides that, the idea of a strategy talks about time, talks about relationship, and talk about continuity and connections. Uh, a strategic, a strategic planning means that you have to attack one part to, in order to solve others, etc. Not necessarily by design in this case. So this, this. For integrated star strategies, we transform this into a, a, some sort of an engine. The first one uh, <clears throat> was environmental balance. So restoration of the watershed, natural landscape recovery, and the creation of a park system. This concept very, very tight was the first elemental thing that we needed to attack in this strategy, the environment. In order to continue or to to tie to uh, to to in order to to relate to to connect with the second one of of this uh, movement of the engine that it was uh, we call it urban dynamics, which which connected con dynamic of local movement, mo mobility, public transportation, but also dynamics in terms of the city is a stock in the, in the in like block the whole connection is blocked so we need how can we unblock this city how can we break this tight uh, uh, tight thing that stops from from the city to evolve to move to go through to 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 allow the the, the liberation of forces so that come came united with the third strategy which was public and private mixed use development. We needed, so this was beyond, this is not only green or not only park or not only balance. This is about construction. This is about housing. This is about continuity of the city life. And the, this is also about uh, sustainability and also the possibility of this uh, um, project being built without, with taking a strategy about the cost and about the, also about the feasibility of the place. And finally, closing the, the engine, closing the, the movement, the most important to me, I think, is the social encounter, which 
is representing the issues of public space, creation of cultural institutions, education and innovation, and the definition of the agora of the city, which is a, all an old concept from Greece that comes from Greece, where the agora was the place to discuss the, city, the ideas of the city, the place to deliver, to, to have the encounters. And by the way, in Greece, there were no women participating, so there were only men in the agora. We, uh, we uh, hope to do it better, increasing, improving the, 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 the people, the, the range of the different people from different places and color and race. And, but the basic, basic issue about this movement is that the city, is, the country is divided and the country, Venezuela, is still divided and it still is, um, is, a, is producing uh, many inequalities, as you have seen before. As, as Robert presented, and also we need to we need to open the doors to the connection, communication of the city, as it used to be. Venezuelan people used to be very used to be very uh, connectivity was very important. Was kind of people that was always happy, uh, optimistic, and had a very good sense of humor and desire to share. So, from this force, these are the four social strategies for Caracas. As you can see, not yet design is involved in this issue. The environmental balance, urban dynamics, mixed use, public, private development, and social encounter, we call it at the end. So let's talk about what each one of them a few minutes. The environmental issues that we found in Caracas, we, we could observe that the river originally was a very nice river. There, there were haciendas in the surroundings that were urbanized. And so at the beginning, the, the, the fact that the river was, had its own place to go through showed us that there was a possibility to do that again. But that was interrupted in the 1950s when the big development of the country started because of the oil boom. The oil boom um, uh, impacted the whole society. There was a massive construction and expansion of the city to the east that included the canalization of the river that you can see here, river, mean river, the construction of uh, urban, suburban, uh, basically um, places that you, for people who live here and will work in the center of the city. And but that also produced later in the years many problems because the 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 base the aerial base in the middle stopped the flow and of, of the flu the flu of the of the rivers that came from the Avila mountain and you you saw a lot of of uh, water uh, floodings in the city a lot of problems every every year there used to be tragedies and there was a main tragedy in 1999 that happened mainly in the, the other side, the littoral came that uh, was landslides and big problems that made us think, think if we are not prepared to, to see this city as a, as, as a solution, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna not going to be able to live here in the future. So this is the situation that you can feel now. This is, this is the, the tight space between the buildings and the quebradas, for example, that come so water that comes from the mountain goes through. When there is an obstacle or anything, the the, the, the situation floods, and there is there are big problems to to solve the the issues of flooding. And for example, and there are categories of flooding along the years. And this is the potential of what could be. This is existing now. It's one of the quebradas from the Avila Mountain in the north, and this is this one goes to the to the river as well as all the quebradas in the in the north part. So this trans concept of environmental um, balance expand uh, tends to be an expansion from the mountain to the uh, north in the right side, through the park into into the river, which is in the, the the south part of the park. So the valley could itself make the best to be to make its transformation if we follow the rules. And if we clean, instead of doing something new, just take out whatever is 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 uh, is, is, mo is too much. So take out the construction in order to create path for for the water and for the uh, biological uh, biodiversity coming from the mountain to the other side. The creation of path 
and green path and using the container of the quebras that exist yeah, that would allow the but that implies breaking the breaking the, the of course the runway the of the airport and transforming the airport into something much more transparent much more connected much more um much more uh, livable for everybody so the, the the first proposal in the in the scale in the in the urban scale is about this idea of a system of parks here to the left you see the parque los Cabos. this is the university the central university of caracas which i will show it to you because it's a model of urban development and when we talk about positive things of the previous century we will talk about this and these are the potential connections of green that does not exist along the river this is the river wide here and and connecting the parque del este with the also north south to la carlota and the Quebrada. so this this is like a basic scheme of the of the balance that we wanted to create in order to recover the, the valley and the technical specific issues that need to be addressed like for example different symbols mean different things of treatment of water treatment of um, cleaning of the waters flood creation of flood plains and different actions in order to put to work the the watershed as a as a system that works in the valley and produces some of the sketches of the process they try to understand this issue of the uh, flooding the flooding we, which is very important we understood that if this is the park the, the future la carlota park one thing that we have to take into account is the, man the management of the topography. The topography allows you to create, in this case, like, like an example, four stages of different flood plains that allow you to have, starting with a small flooding that happens every year, for sure, in the rainy season, that would, you can calculate it and you can say, okay, probably number one is enough for the year uh, yearly flood that happens in this uh, happens in this area if the flood is stronger that happens every instead of every every five years probably well you can get more you can get more water and you will have uh, you will have a second stage of the flood plain so this will be all flooded and then in the same way 20 years or 100 years probably in 100 years you can have all, the whole site flooded completely and you are by that way protecting every everybody else, protecting the from flooding the people who live around, protecting the other urban areas around, and also going through the river and going previous places that have flooded could could solve that problem just like planning in this site the flooding of the whole city. So this was one of the other effects of this, plus other possibilities of construction that you can see here. So this this um, rendering shows what could happen in the the difference between uh, the, the the time of rain the two seasons that we have the temp season of rain and the season of dryness and you can see that in these diagrams in the right side when you see the 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 middle one is like the restitution of the valley where how it should be with the water flowing and the previous one is the the situation today when you have the, the flooding happening at the every time the the quebradas go go to reach the, the airport and they don't have enough space to go through on the under the under the the, the runway <clears throat> okay so this is the park itself the topography the modification of the topography that could, we could do in order to create the floodplains and at the same time the location of uh, uh, plants of treatment treatment of dark waters into cleaner water for uh, irrigation and not for drinking but for irrigation and also also to keep the flow of the river alive uh, all year all time not not only as a sewer that goes and we could have that in parallel so we can have the flow the flow of the river better calculated and this would more or less you would see this is like the atmosphere very well captured of the colors of the city uh, when these natural areas are activated and and this would happen in the future 
So the, sec the second one, we call it urban dynamics because it's more, it's not only about mobility, it's about mobility, but more than that, it's about movement in, uh, and, and it's about the taking out some issues, also taking out things that that bother the, and uh, avoid the connection between the between the, the city and the and the and the environment. And it is this the dream that Caracas had, like Los Angeles in the United States or other cities in the States, basically, of the automobile that would solve the problems. Everybody, the dream was to have the, the, your automobile go to work and return and have a real uh, experience, a very nice uh, suburban experience. Well, that's never that never worked. And suddenly, very soon, this started to congest, and every including the the work moved to the east. So, what happened was that the, the city was congested in both both directions, and and uh, and that happened after after that situation. Uh, so, this integration, the, the the point is how to integrate the metro system which exists. With the uh, with the cable train that already exists, and the metro cable that started to produce after the Medellin experience, we started to prove the metro cable as well. So also, how to um, how to create or organize this mobility system that could that could be functional and work. So this is a combination of the different mobility issues. That the one I'm going to mention here is the one with La Carlota itself. The proposal was in the case as the, there is a confluence of different lines here. We propose like a loop around La Carlota that would connect that this is very important. One of the most isolate, isolated parts of the city that is the, the Barrio Petare North, Petare, Total Petare, which is big, huge, is the second more populated barrio in Latin America, I think in the world. After, after one in Buenos Aires, eh, I'm sorry, after one in Rio de Janeiro. And the, the Petare has been all, always behind this wall, which is a separation. But this gives the opportunity through the River Guaire, using the, the Rio de Janeiro, the, the avenue along the Guaire, to transform this into a, also a transportation element that could connect Petare with La Carlota and put the people from Petare in, in the doors of the whole, the big city. To move anywhere where they wanted to work or recreation, and some simple graphics about how to take the graph, how to organize the traffic without adding anything again, just taking out the runway and connect, transforming this big, big, big parcel into three blocks, three super blocks. Each block divided by a street. This is a city street, so this pretends to be a, a par, a pair of uh, streets that go around and create some kind of uh, <clears throat> pair system. So you had the, the three blocks, I'm sorry, the three blocks down here interconnected and, and each part of the park will have its own character. Basically, I would say character or a, um, So this system, this circulation came accompanied with the proposal of new streets, like the streets in a city, breaking completely into the side, not the separating not tunnels under the and, and the, the runway or anything that some people propose, or not bridges, but at the same level. And the, the only way to do it is eliminating the, the runway specifically. So these are examples of the of the and this rendering views of the loop. This would be the loop of the the, the Petare my uh, cable train that this one goes around the Carlota proposal and this is the north side and then from here they will go to Petare again. This represents one of the entrances of the park. And the idea of an urban street that could be like a walking pedestrian street, like a Rambla, in the in the section of the separating the new development of the in, 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 in the new uh, urban development in terms of real estate with the old with the park itself. So in terms of the urban dynamics, there is another problem that we discovered and had to be attacked, is that the fact that Caracas also has, besides problems with water, has also um, earthquakes. And there was a big one in 67, where La Carota played a very important role in bringing goods and bringing, in bringing uh, medicines and equipment, and basically, and also taking out patients 
So, so the, the, the runway in La Carlota was needed, is needed actually. So we discovered, and, and we departed from the hypothesis that there are helicopters that can solve the problems of uh, provisions, provisions for this site more efficiently than the Hercules plane that is the only plane that can work in this, in this area. And with the less impact, negative impact, and more positive, positive, more positive impact, for several reasons. One is because this is, there is a system of of helipo, helico, helicopters or heliports in this in the region that can help to organize the, the an emergency in case using light helicopters or heavy helicopters or movement of things, and that can be connected to many places in the city so if this is the tragedy happens in the in the hills in the barrios that can be solved uh, and it's not only something that happens in the center that can be resolved by the by the service so this this gives a, an opportunity to think and a study even passengers uh, planes this is an example of 90 and there were uh, helicopters of 70 or smaller passengers, big helicopters that can be replaced. But at the same time, you can land here simultaneously eight helicopters in, in this area. And instead, instead, you can land one plane in a rare thing because the plane also needs not only a runway, but also hangars, also um, um, services uh, in both sides of the, of, the, of, the, of the runway. But so the, this difficult completely the, the performance of the, of the airport as well. So this, this was the first solution for for a place to solve the emergencies concentrated in the west side of the park and leaving the rest of the park and keeping only a small portion of the of the runway for the helicopters to land and move and and move and mobilize around and having possibility of accumulating containers and things like that for the case of some some humanitarian help or something. Okay, the third one. Well, how are we in time? The third, the third, yeah. The third one is the mixed use development, and I'm gonna go a little faster. So one of the things that eliminating the the, the runway affects is something called the approximation, the cone of approximation of the of the of the of the airport, which means that in both sides you have like in these diagrams a set of uh, limitations for the build for the planes to land and, and elevate that avoid the need that the, the possibility of construction more density if we eliminate the runway we also eliminate the cone and we create the option for a place that can be clean like this and you can have some density uh, as much as you need and create some, something much more uh, much more development that can provide the, uh, help to construct the, the park. So you can see here examples that we we were uh, these are these are sur tests that we did in, in in the office in Medellin, trying finding uh, solutions for the for the housing and other uses in the perimetry of the park. And these are tests uh, also uh, so that we 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 work in many many times like that. And finally, okay, this this proposal that came in more when we got closer proposes the fact that, that this housing and this uh, construction can be in the surroundings of the park, but we don't have the land, we didn't have the property of the land, so we propose to use the the land that is left, the, the air rights, the air rights of the highway that is spans here, so you could work in work on top of the uh, building on top of the highway, we could create semi-tunnels, not, not the whole portion, but partial tunnels that could, could allow you to have part of the housing on the, on the top. So these are examples uh, that we tested about the location of some typologies of building that could fit into the area. This one, for example, is the Rio de Janeiro in, in the south, uh, beyond the river. There's like a big path, a big rambla or or to to with some uh, you can see some examples here um, you can see some other examples i don't i'm not going into much detail do you see some examples with the highway under the buildings in, in la floresta 
that show the, the possibility in the, the lower part could be like uh, some parking areas and some commercial, of course, and retail and other activities. And the terraces can be used as well in the fourth floor. And the street goes continues down the internal street of the park and the highway is parallel under the building. And these are different examples and this is the Rio de Janeiro. And finally, the, 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 the point about social encounter. Well, these are protests that has happened in the last 10 years in the, in the, in the area of, La, of close to La Carlota and parallel to the why, why they're taking the highway. And you can see the proportion of them, the amount of people protesting against the government. And, and this chance that they, the, the Carlo, La Carlota is completely empty while something like this is happening. So people is climbing for a place to, to, to discuss the ideas, to, to have uh, um, interchange. And, and so this is, this is what ended being the final proposal of the first, of the second phase with the existing situation. Now the proposed areas and the buildings in the north and south here you see too, and also some solutions. The, the fact that this part is existing as the flat part, the flattest part in the area could be the, the emergency helicopter place like we saw before, but also would be the place for the concerts and events that we call the Agora. So views of different views of the, of the Agora in concerts and activities in, in sketches that show more or less the image and, and the density that we propose in the surroundings by creating, creating, not having the approximation cone, we could create that type of environment that contains a space that is going to be protected by for the whole city. Okay. Um, any uh, any comment? I think uh, I did at the end. I had I run a little bit because I want to, I want to present. I think uh, if there is no question, immediately burning question. Also, you have the chat, so you can make them by writing. So let's go directly. This this um, uh, designing for life has has had branches also besides the events, the big events that we had in 2008, 2013, 2014 or 13. I we have we have had several other events, and one important one has been the continuation of the per parameters of designing for life and the methodology. And in in studios, in distant studios with the students from Wentworth, and we have done um, we we did one last semester, and uh, this one is uh, uh, this was uh, oh no this was. This is not the group. This is this announced the this is the continuity of okay, this is okay, this is the design for life position. So in, in the fall we did the Caracas 20 studio for and then we continue in this spring, this is spring semester with the Caracas 21, which is which is the continuation of the findings that we had in the the Caracas 20 studio. And just to show you some of the findings and some of the discussion that affected the whole is Car of Caracas. One, for example, is the, the, the Cota Mill. The, the, this is, the Cota Mill is like a belt that surrounds the, the, the city in the north side, specifically, you can see it here. That the, basically was built to, to, to produce traffic, to produce um, solutions of traffic between the east and west to limit the growth of the city, this is a, the, the unique aspect, to limit the growth of the city, not beyond the, the 1,000 height uh, contour. So beyond this is a total park, it's like a total natural resort that has to be protected uh, and, and preserved. And, and beyond that, in the lower part, uh, there is uh, the city. So the students uh, develop a um, uh, same system of solutions along the along the on top of the cotton mill, creating like a belt, creating like a continuous, uh, and there are different versions of that. 
and there were there was analysis done um, by the students about different typologies of uh, housing that have approached the have approached the 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 the, the, the case before. So this this was some images of the model also developed with the students develop a, a RGIS and the RGIS uh, program for the east of the whole country. So the whole city is programmed like that. And the places where the cotton mill can be per permanently can be perforated under and passed through. So you can see the in order to create the visits to the park in the north. So these are just sketches and and the, and the model the model uh, with the presence of the break the the frame breaking the connection or tra transmitting the connection in in several places including the 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 flow of air and and biodiversity and all that. So this was uh, we had we we also designed with the students uh, the like uh, the, the quebradas the ravines of the east of Caracas. One of the issues that came in the, the discussion was the fact that in order to do this, to, to improve, improve, improve the, the grass, you have to clean the, the best, the, 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 the informal, not the informal, the, the uses the, that have blocked that connection. So we had to offer housing for, for, for low income families to, to use and also um, solving the, the, the buildings that could be in the Cota Mill or in the, in the same quebradas. We also propose with the students the solutions for housing. So this is a sequence of different approaches, different different views of the quebradas with the construction that uh, they propose. In, 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 in internally trying to create uses to densify and at the same time to clean the quebradas and leave the water flow. So the, these are the different approaches that uh, the student had. Some um, are part of the plan. Like this is part of a plan, but they had he had some buildings to to show that create in one in one side creating the city the traditional city grid uh, in 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 one side and the new facade to the quebra to the natural environment in the in the interior. So this is an example, and uh, th this um, north of the of, of the wide continue of north of the valley continue with the connection entrance to exit to the city from the end, at the end of the Cota Mill to to the exit to to the east, and the the possible proposal of a urbanization in this area of the city that is completely clean. So these are also images from the students. And uh, finally, we have two students, three three students work in Petare Norte, uh, an area that is the, 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 that I showed before that is separated from the city that we want to integrate. We were thinking how to integrate it with the city itself. So there, there were two solutions that were very interesting. One uh, in 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 field in field land where there were not. Too many houses, and they have anyway. They had to really remove some houses to, 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 and, and give them the chance to to acquire another uh, other unit in order to clean the space for a, a library that was in the spirit of the libraries in Bogota, in Bogota, Colombia. With the, this is Tamara, student from Guatemala, that proposed this this library with open spaces. Uh, in order to create a theater, like a, like an amphitheater, and secondly, secondly, no, one second, this is okay. This is this before. This is the location of the both projects at in in the so one is located in 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 this in this ramp. This is part of the street. It is the exact street that doesn't have. Enough. Uh, the, the steepness and the, the curves are so tight that the the jeeps, the jeeps that go up here cannot cannot turn. They have to go up and down. And one student working here, and the other in one end of this connection, and the other student working in this area created. This was the, the, in another part here in the barrio created the 
the possibility of a, li a library in one side and housing in the other. So this is the the application of this, this special structure in the in the place where the the race of the of the jeeps was located, and she proposed this urban, I would say vertical, semi-vertical streets because it has the the horizontal part with an elevator and the vertical street that connects the barrio in in in, the, in one of the entrances, and the the section of the same building here. So, so certain views of the the same building, and I think that was the okay. Good because timing, Manuel. Time, good timing is fine. Okay, yes. That's perfect. Okay, good. That so, was a good, good going. So one thing, uh, leave this slide up. Please keep sharing your screen. One yeah. thing that you should all be aware of is that a year ago, the students producing this work that you're looking at we're sitting where you are now. They were students in this course. Uh, we talked about right from the first uh, class meeting, <coughs> this course is being taught to prepare you for the future. And the future that we have targeted is the future in which you are at the peak <coughs> of your years. It's about the year 2050 and you are taking up leadership positions uh, to help solve some of these problems as architects, as urbanists, and as mayors, perhaps, um, uh, or at least advisors to mayors. The other closer future that we are teaching towards, we are teaching this course in order to support your success in the fall uh, concentration studio that you will be taking uh, sooner than you think. Next September, you will all be enrolled in Studio 7. And something you should notice is that the views that these students are, take, are picking up are very closely related to the views that they did in their analysis work. It turns out that these architectural tools and methods for looking at architecture of cities is not just for analysis in the concentration studies course. It's also for developing, proposing, testing, and revising and refining the projects that you will be doing in the studio next fall and in your careers. So I want to make sure everyone is clear on that connection. I would ask you to nod your head yes, but I only see a third of you. Where are the cameras that are supposed to be on? The next thing is yes, there is a graded chat going on now in Brightspace. Two thirds of you are participating, one third of you are missing out. Um, the questions that appear in that chat are really important for Manuel and I to look at, study, and figure out how do we teach this course more effectively to respond to these urgent questions that you have. In the meantime, while we struggle with that, don't wait for us to figure it out. How can your questions, how can the questions that you're reading in that chat be addressed by you between now and Wednesday? The analysis work we would like you to do uh, is uh, one thing to think about is what are the most urgent questions that you and your classmates have? And how do you start the process of exploring those questions through the analysis assignment? So anyone who can connect a question from the chat to what they do in the analysis is uh, really doing a fantastic job in terms of the ambitions of this course. And finally, the last thing I wanna say before we go is in the analysis paragraph, we do expect you to refer to something that's not in the image. One thing, one point should come from somewhere outside of the image. Everything else should come from the image itself. So everything that you talk about in your paragraph should come from the image and your analysis of the image. You, with the one exception is you can add one point 
that is not from the image. And as long as you give it a footnote citation, it might be from the reading that you had this week. It might be from the reading last week. It might be something that was said in the lecture that you thought was interesting. Yes, we do expect you to pay attention to the lecture. This is not entertainment. Yes, we do expect you to take notes. The notes you take in this lecture will help you prepare for the analysis process, will help you prepare for next week, will help you prepare for the studio next fall, will help you prepare for your client meetings three years from now, and will help you, yes, to prepare for taking a leadership role in solving these problems during your careers in the coming decades. This will all be on the test, and by the test, I mean the test of life. So with that said, we've gone over time. We apologize. Thank you for sticking around. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you want to hang back, if you have a question, please hang back and Manuel and I will answer your questions. Uh, for the rest of you, uh, thank you very much. Good luck with your analysis and we will see you on Wednesday. We'll see you on Wednesday. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good thank you. weekend. Have a good weekend. Thank you.